Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld, your host of the DevOps Lunch and Learn. This week, we had a very interesting conversation with John Sharber about Scaffold, which is um, Kubernetes related uh, project for building CI infrastructure. Uh, super detailed and technical, um, a lot of YAML. And uh, so that conversation is first. And if you want to hear our opening discussion, that's at the end. If you want to talk at one of these, please. Deep topics, light topics, fluffy topics, you name it. It's a place for you to, to chat about something that's interesting to you related to DevOps IT industry. Uh, please just contact me and we'll set it up. Thanks. Is, is, is how many people are actually doing Kubernetes at this point in life? Uh, yeah, to one okay. extent or another. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, let me just throw up some stuff here and um so we're a kubernetes cool. shop right and um everything we do is wrapped around the kubernetes side although we, we do provide some um, brownfield mi migration into the stuff we actually do and so we started looking at you know ci and cd tool systems inside of the kubernetes ecosystem there's really kind of two predominant ones. One is Scaffold, which I'll give you a little bit of an introduction today. And then the other one is Tekton. Um, and, and the next slide, I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit why we went down the Scaffold side of, of life. Uh, but these are both systems that are designed to basically uh, automate the CI process and the deployment process into Kubernetes clusters, either uh, running the CI process in the Kubernetes cluster or basically pushing things into the Kubernetes cluster or hybrid of both. Um, and so Scaffold is one of the tools. Um, and we happen to like it because we think it's got a better data model. We think it is closer to the way a CI CD pipeline should be built. Um, and so at a very high level, if you think about what Scaffold actually does, um, it basically works as a continuous development tool. So there is a, a piece of it that basically watches the source code file, looks for changes, and then recompiles those components to it. Um, there's a builder component to it, which whether it's going to take a Docker file, Bazel file, um, you can actually specify custom builders in it as well. But effectively, it's going to build your application and it's going to then package that application. Um, once that application is packaged, in other words, is put into a Docker uh, container, right? It allows you to then execute container tests against that to verify that the container you built was um proper right it wasn't missing components to other pieces to it and then it basically tags that and the tagging really has a lot to do with and it's imperfect and i'll explain a little bit how this ties into customize but if you're trying to deploy multiple um, instances of an application to a kubernetes cluster you want to be able to know which um, container was put into which pod and so there's a number of tagging strategies allow you to do it by default we're just using the commit get, get commit id into it Right, and then once that's done, it's going to basically push that artifact out to whatever your deployment environment is. And so that could be cube control, it could be home, or it could be customized. Um, and so this is kind of the flow that you get within a scaffold component to it. And I'm just going to walk through this, I'll just show you examples because that's easier to understand than, than looking at some of these pieces to it. Um, and then basically, this is the way kind of the pipeline gets together. Um, so, so just a different view of those components to it. And in our world, we think there's a few things missing in this pipeline. Um, we'd like to be able to insert things into the pipeline, but unfortunately, Scaffold is built as a monolith. Um, while it does support the venting that you can tie into it, it doesn't really support a flexible way of being able to insert things or remove things from the pipeline. Um, and so we like the way they've done these components to it. They've broken it down into logical responsibilities inside of the pipeline. Um, but they haven't done it in such a way that it's made it extensible or composable in the pipeline. And we are talking with the scaffold team about how this might get modified to allow us to more easily plug things in. And I'll give you an example uh, towards the end of things we'd like to plug into the pipeline. But you know, one example right at the top is it's great that you can tag the images, but I might want to tag the entire component to it. And, and without being able to do that, it creates limitations of what I can and cannot do with this tool. So this is kind of what the scaffold stuff does. And then just to give you an idea of the command lines that it goes through, there's a scaffold init, um, which basically creates a, a very a simple scaffold.yaml file, which is the, the pipeline definition that's going to get executed. Um, there's a scaffold dev, which basically executes the pipeline and then watches for file changes uh, and then basically redeploys the artifacts as part of that pipeline. 
there's scaffold run, which basically doesn't do the continuous watching of the files. It just does the deployment to it. There's a debug to it. There's a render. So if you want to see what is the output, uh, the manifest files that get generated out of this, uh, render simply displays that to the, the screen. And then there's a scaffold delete, which basically goes and deletes all the artifacts that were deployed into your Kubernetes clusters. So that's going to be your service, um, your replica controllers, your deployments, your pods, all the other pieces that go with it. Um, so those are the basic commands. There's not a lot you have to actually learn that goes with it. Um, the second piece I kind of put into these things is, uh, oh, sorry, I was going to go, I thought I had a different slide here. Um, you can control where images get pushed, right? And so uh, by that, I mean that it looks at the cube context. So if I'm running, we run micro KS for a single node cluster locally. Uh, but if I also have a cluster running in GCP or AWS or Azure, it doesn't really matter. When I change my cube context, it will basically deploy to that particular cluster into it. So it really kind of is agnostic of where it's being deployed. It's using kind of standard, standardized Kubernetes constructs for moving, for managing the deployments to it. Uh, and there's another component, and I'll show you kind of how that works into this stuff, which is profiles. And so profiles and kind of the, the notion of immutable infrastructure is I've got some base level profile rather than have 20 versions of that particular configuration. A profile allows me to override it and basically create a new version of that. So it effectively takes the base version, applies new components to it, and generates a new artifact out of those pieces to it. And I just put a, a quick example of a profile here. I'll show you one kind of in the real world. But in this case, I can have a profile called profile one, and I can specify it on the command line using the dash P option, but I can also specify it using an activation. So I can say, for example, if the environment variable uh, magic bar is set to 42, then this profile is automatically active. Uh, act, what's the word I'm looking for? Automated, act, activated, I can say that. That's the word right there on the screen. Um, so, and that's kind of, I'll show you kind of how we do something when we look at like debugging Go programs in Kubernetes cluster, um, where, you know, just setting a Go debug variable would allow you to actually automatically take advantage of that and then unsetting it to turn those pieces off to it. But at a very high level, this is kind of what Scaffold actually does. And then the other piece that goes into it is when we deploy these things out, if you remember the first screen I put in here, um, I said you can use cube control, you can use Helm, and you can use customize, right? And so customize is what we're actually using in this. Um, and to kind of explain customize, I think the version, the, the examples will make this clearer for you. Um, is It's the same type of component, it's the same type of rationale of, I don't want to have 50 different configuration files on immutable infrastructures where I start with a base configuration, right? I apply my changes to the base configuration for a given environment, right? And then that generates the actual manifest that's gonna get applied to pieces to it. Um, we don't follow conventions. Um, so uh, you'll see in the files down here, we'll have a, a, a YAML attribute called bases in here, and that's where we start. So that in theory, normally in customize, I've got a base, that is my default configuration file. Um, expressed in YAML into it. Um, and, and then what I would have is an environment like dev, dev test, staging, other pieces to it. And those are what they would refer to as overlays. And so the overlays normally get applied on top of the base. Um, that actually doesn't um, make a lot of sense to me for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, one of which is I, I think you may have more than one base. It's more likely you're going to have a dev manifest. And then your, your staging manifest is, is likely something you don't want to patch. It's likely to be something very different than it. Um, and effectively, it's really a different base into it. Um, when we specify a base, then it can be specified either as a file path, so dot, dot, slash, base, or it can be specified as a URL. And so when you think about how you're basically managing um, your, your source code management in these pieces, normally your base is either a checked out instance of a um, Git repository or you're basically um, specifying the Git repository and the reference you want to pull out in the URL to it. Um, and then the other piece of these things, and I'll show you examples, is these things can be shared or inherited. So there may be some things you want to apply across all of your manifests and your Kubernetes clusters, or there's certain pieces you want to inherit it just by different components to it. Um, and I think I already kind of explained that the, the overlays modify um, what's in the base component to it. Um, Resources are the other thing you'll see in the file. And so the resources, so the base is really where should I look for things. 
and resources are within that directory, what are the specific things I want to manage? So if I had 50 YAML files in a given directory, they won't be touched unless they're specified as part of the resource file directory. And then the last piece, and they use these terms really kind of um, interchangeably to it, you'll see generators, you'll see transformers, and you'll see plugins. Uh, but effectively, these are ways of extending the customized framework into it. And so the built-in ones, and I'll show you an example of these as well. Um, you can have ones to generate secrets, ones to generate config maps, uh, namespace transformers that go into it, or you can basically create your own. It can be a bash script or a, a go file. And there's a number of things in here where they have a set transformer and validator. So if you want to write some custom validation on top of these things, you can create a generator or transformer that would basically take your YAML file, process it, and either basically uh, modify it to basically be conformant to it or could actually exit the process into it. Uh, so these are kind of the top level pieces of customized. And then I'll show you this, it'll make more sense. Um, you know, there's tagging in these things. And so scaffold, as you kind of see when you get in these things, you'll see it tags the images to it. And then customized tags the generated configuration, so config maps and secrets. Um, and I just make a point of saying this doesn't ensure deployments are always unique, which is kind of the intent here. Um, so if you imagine that I've got two instances of a given application running, um, and one's coming off of branch A and one's coming off of branch B, my configurations may very well be different from them. So basically tagging the configurations means I don't have namespace collision on that. But since it doesn't tag the name of the deployment, um, you, you still have a namespace collision on that sort of things. So those are kind is, of the, the yeah, go ahead. Is, is your, is the idea here that you're taking it all the way through to production from a deployment perspective, or is this mostly about building the test, the test infrastructure? It, it's been used in both ways. So I think there, there's pieces to the, the CID CD pipeline. Um, the, so like if you're going to say what's missing in this stuff, right? So in our case, um, you know, we'll kick off a Travis build job through our integrated CI piece when we check something in. That's not something that's supported directly as part of, of the um, scaffold or the customized pieces of things. Um, but, you know, they're working towards being able to actually create a more full form CI CD pipeline. So right now I use it more on the dev side, but you certainly can use it to modify to deploy to test staging or product. That makes sense. I mean, my original impression was that it was a dev test pipeline to build containers, and then you'd have another process to to do your your deploy to prod. But um, and yeah. so from this, it sounds like it has the capability of going all the way through if that was your goal. Well, it does. So, like when you're running in dev mode, so here here's the kind of pieces that are missing in, in my mind. Right? It is um, you know, if I go back to this picture up here, right? I, I want a proper event bus underneath this, right? So that if I want to go trigger a, another build process, another step on something underneath it, I can actually do that. Um, and so I can do that in dev mode, by the way. If I'm running in the dev mode on scaffold, there is an API that gives you HTTP and, and GRCP events that would allow me to make it more complete, right? I, I would say the ability to generate the various artifacts you need to deploy to, to the various environments, I think scaffold does a decent job at that. The ability to extend it and add other things into it is not there today. And that's one of the things we've been talking to that team about. So for example, today, they're only supporting Helm 2. So if you want Helm 3, it's a pull request, right? So that doesn't make a lot of sense for a lot of people, right? Um, and then I'm, I'm going to skip this for a second. Let me um, escape out of this and flip into this piece. Let me just kind of show you how we kind of organize some stuff. So, so far, I, I want to do that as a little background and some context. Does that make sense to people at this point? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so the way we kind of organize our stuff. And so, um, so we've been working on a, a framework that basically creates microservices. Um, and so, you know, part of that microservice piece is obviously building out the CI framework to be able to actually test and deploy those components to it. And the way I've kind of organized my stuff, if you just look at the directory down here, it was underneath the top level code directory. I create a manifest directory. Um, and inside of that, you'll see the Docker compose file. So the Docker compose file is here because we have to be able to execute our code tests locally. 
Um, we have different versions of that um, that basically work with Go tests that go into it, the Docker file uh, for building the application to itself. And in this case, is another, uh, if you're familiar in Kubernetes, when you're basically bringing up a pod, you're also allowed to have things to do pre-work for it. So in this case, what they call the NIP containers. And so in our testing case, it's something I wouldn't necessarily want in a test or a staging case, I need to basically create the databases that are there. So we have an init container uh, that executes before the main container actually executes into it. And underneath that, you can see the number of services need to be brought up. So we have, so this, this first four up here execute locally, right? So this is really enabling the developer to execute their tests. And the second part is to be able to deploy and then test against Kubernetes pieces down here. And so I organize my Kubernetes stuff into a Kubernetes directory. I've got a dev environment underneath it, right? And underneath that, I've got a directory for each of the major services that are going to be deployed below it, right? And then down below here, you'll notice I have another environment called dev debug. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And then the last file on this one is the scaffold.yaml itself. Um, so in this case, where you have this dev directory up here, I mentioned kind of the convention in the compose stuff is to have a bases directory. So normally that would have been labeled base, but I use the dev environment as kind of my base. And then when I want to override it, I just point to that as my base. And I'll show you the config file so that makes a bit more sense, hopefully. Um, and then if I just vi here, vi vim, um, you know, what a scaffold file looks like, right? If you're used to Kubernetes, it, it's relatively straightforward. It's got an API, it's got a kind, it's got the metadata name into it. So this is basically for the films. And then basically, if you remember our diagram going across, we had build, right? And we had deploy. And so this is specifying what happens in the build directory. Um, and I'll point out a couple of, of idiosyncrasies in here. So we run a local repository on our micro KDS. So we basically list it is a non-secure repository, so that's what's going to get pushed in. We, we have down here then the artifacts that we get built, and so this one has the, the local host, acne demo or demo account, and films going into it. Uh, and then we have a custom section down here. So one of the things that uh, unfortunately Docker files don't really give you is a good way to specify which source code files to look for, because all the Docker file knows about is this image is going to get built. And so if I just put this image ID in here, I will have to basically remake the image file. Um, in other words, do a, a new Docker build of that in order for it to basically trigger um, the rebuild of, of the actual application, the redeployment of it. Um, and so what I kind of put in here, you can see there's a custom section in here, dependencies, and here we specify, you know, actually anything with the go.path into it. We, we could have done subdirectories if we had them in this case, we don't. Right, that goes into these pieces. And then we have a second one here, which is our just initializing the films DB. And, and since we pointed this at the manifest directory, we'll find a Docker file. But in this case, we have to tell it for the init DB, we have to tell it specifically where the Docker file's at. Right. And then down here, the deploy piece, we specify customize, uh, we specify the paths to be one or more uh, to go into it. So we just say we're going to look at the, the manifest that Kubernetes not dev. And we'll take a look at that in a second, see what it looks like. Um, and then we'll come back at this in a second. Um, but you see, I did one simple profile down here. And so one of the other modes you can do in this is I can actually do a scaffold debug, as you saw in there. But the scaffold debug, so scaffold debug will launch your um, container in the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and in the case of Go, it will basically launch a Go Dell debug client in headless mode. Um, so I could then attach to that using a local dev instance and then actually do debugging of my application inside of the cluster. So this is kind of facilitating. I want to basically do that. And, and to do that, though, you have to self-identify, meaning that I have to set some environment variable that it will recognize as go. In this case, that environment is going to basically go, to go debug equals true. Um, and so this is an example of profile that fits into these things. Um, so I go down at the artifacts, um, oops, not artifacts, manifest. Um, I'll go down to Kubernetes, I'll go down at the dev, and let's take a look at the top level. So when I point it to that top level directory you see over here, um, so I've got my manifest devs, Kubernetes over here. You can see inside of that, it's going to look for a file called customization.yaml, right? And that's the file we see over here. And in that one, if I bring it up, once again, we've got our API version of kind, 
Um, and now what I've actually got is things that basically go into these things. So in this case, it's got a namespace called paper. Right. I haven't actually created that namespace yet. So if I just executed this, it would actually fail. And then it specifies each of the subdirectories, in this case, Kafka, DB, and Films, right? And it specifies the resources this manage, which is the file namespace.yaml, which just creates our, our YAML or creates our namespace definition for it. Right. And then we have common labels, we have common annotations. So basically when we talk about inheritance. What you see inside of this is that everything is going to have a common label of paved road environment dev. And then what I do in here is try and document the source of truth. So I know where this came from. It came from Films Manifest Kubernetes dev, right? And I know what my bases are to actually process as part of these things. So this is going to basically process this file. It's going to look at this file, this namespaces.yaml. Um, it's going to create that namespace from that. And then it's going to start looking in each of these subdirectories to basically get at those things. So let's just take a look at like the, the Kafka piece down in here, um, another customized that YAML piece in here, all right? Um, and that's gonna basically, that's not the right file. Uh, that doesn't look right. Looks better. So this one now has the resource, the films deployment, films.yaml. Um, it's got the common labels that's going to apply, which can be extensive. So if we look, for example, at the um, Kafka components, we don't have these same labels in here. Um, it would be different for that one. So this is inherits from the top level, but then each of the sub levels below could be different. And then in this case, I basically use a config map generator, right? So um, one of the problems with Kubernetes, and this is where quite frankly the plugins would actually help, you can specify loading your configuration from an existing YAML file. Uh, unfortunately, what Kubernetes does is take the name of that YAML file as the key and then the contents of it as a value. So unless your application knows how to parse out the value of it, right, you don't get the environment variables created out of it. And so this is kind of a, a a poor version of how you would actually do these things. We're basically just saying create a config map, right? I'm going to give it a name of it, films config map, and then create the following rules as part of these things. Can you um, use an env n from file for that? Using what? n from file in your deployment spec. You can give it a you can give it a config map of yes, yeah. So the config map name in the deployment spec would be the, the films .config map. Right, but what's going to happen when we actually generate that out um, is you're going to see config map dash and then some hexadecimal ID. Right, so since each deployment could potentially have a different config map, that's what I kind of made the point in the presentation uh, I was trying to go through is that the, the scaffold piece, uh, if I go back to this, scaffold tags config maps and secrets. So while you would just put in there the, the Films.config map is as the key inside of your um, deployment component to it. Um, when you see it deployed, it's going to have this extra um, suffix on the end of it, which is designed to make it unique. Right? You can kind of get the fact that's not going to really work all the way through. All right? So if I do the deployment and and it is operating in that way, it, it doesn't help me a lot if I try and deploy. If I do a deployment and the name of the deployment is Films and my config map is unique, and I go to do another deployment, the name of that deployment is also Films, right? We still have namespace conflicts into it. And so there's a number of ways I could deal with that, right? I could deal with that by basically um, suffixing um, as part of these configurations, a, a version to it or a dev environment or a dev debug or something like that to it. So I have the name to flexibly rename the various components of it out of my customized specifications. Um, into it, but um, it doesn't automatically solve that problem of all the configs. I mean, your, your service names are still not unique. Um, your deployment names are still not unique into it. Simply your config maps and your um, images or pods are unique as part of doing the deployments. And so when you're doing it, you should think about, you know, which other components that want to be unique. Do I want to deploy these things into different namespaces and, and other components? But that that's kind of fine because once you're done with that, right, you, you can easily now go back in and specify and you're customized that when I go deploy something else, right, I, I want that to be, so let me pop out of this file for a second. Um, 
let's go back into here and look at um, you know, this customize.yaml, right? So this is now a customized file, but you can see in here, I've actually specified a suffix to be applied. Right, so these are going to get a dash dev suffix into it, and this is basically the customized piece that gets applied when I run the dev debug profile. Right, so this is going to basically take what I want overridden in this, and it's going to take that from the debug EM. I'll show you that in a second. It's going to look its base now is going to be dot dot slash dev, so it's going to look in the dev directory just looking at, and then it's going to apply what's in this debug.yaml file as its override. So this is a pretty simple example, right? And in any ways, all right. Um, uh, basically, just saying I'm looking for the metadata in films. I'm looking for uh, labels that go into it. And here I got my temp, my spec. Excuse my spec, my template, my spec. And then I'm looking for a container with the name films. And in this case, I'm doing. You can see in here, I'm doing strategic merge path. So it's going to look if the names are the same, it will do a merge into it. If the names are different, it will actually add it into it. Component. So this is doing a merge of this information into the spec. So at the end of the day, what I should have when I apply this profile is an environment variable called go debug in the value set through. All right, does that make sense so far? Yep. I I oh, think maybe. I'm following. <laughs> that makes <Sorry>. sense. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of YAML. Yeah. What in this world is a lot of YAML? That's it, the, I, it's it, the simplify it as much as I can, right? You, you're, you're taking your, your YAML files. Anything that's going to be common, just specify at a higher level and let customize apply it to the lower levels into it. When I want to okay. specialize something for a different environment, like in this case, I've got dev. In this case, I have dev debug onto it. I basically do that by specifying a overlay, right, in the context of, of the, the customized components to it. And the way I invoke that particular overlay is in my um, scaffold uh, um, camel down here. I basically put that into a profile, right? So this is my default. I'm going to do my deployment out of my, my manifest Kubernetes dev, right? But when I override that, I can create a profile. And the override to those default profiles are going to basically be found in this dev debug, right? And there's nothing, by the way, just to be clear, I could have 20 of these things, right? So I could say, I could break all my specific overlays into the different directories as they make sense, right? And, and by the way, this actually, when I was getting ready to do this yesterday, this used to be path. And they modified it in the latest version of path, so they actually broke my YAML. <laughs> so, I had to quickly go fix that stuff. Um, yes, I know I didn't do that. Um, so basically, if you want to know what it looks like, I put a couple other utilities in here. I'm trying to be respectful on time so people can ask some questions into it. Uh, but I just do like a scaffold. If I can type, right, let's just do dev. Um, it'll specify my, my scaffold file in here. So this is like a normal execution environment into it. And so basically, you can actually see it goes down. It didn't need to build the image. If it did, it would have done that. It's now deploying it. In this case, it's a little bit larger image. We're deploying uh, for our message bus in here. We're deploying Zookeeper and Kafka, uh, which is where we log all of our details out to it. And then it's going to wait for these pieces to come up to speed. Uh, so this is running in dev mode. Now, when I'm in dev mode, if I just control C out of this, it will clean up my cluster for me. If I do a scaffold run, I'll need to go do a scaffold delete to clean my cluster out into it. Uh, so this is kind of flipping through those pieces, and I'll show you a couple other things when this piece gets up. And films, by the way, we, we have a number of silly applications we've created. So in the process of trying to create example applications, I created a, a films rating database, uh, which is what this particular thing does. And then my wife created a wine rating application, but it was more of a pandemic flavor to it. So it's, it's how do you weight, you know, boxed wines. Uh, we have a number of really important criteria, like a test control, a good bottle of wine versus a, a bad box of wine. You know, how many, how much dollars per ounce do we like the packaging or not? Really, really important pieces to it. Uh, so if you look at something like this, what's really going to go on in this is I kind of wait for it to come up. Um, I just kind of use these pieces in here. Yeah, I did my cockroach whatever. Three or four, come on, come on. I'll show you one other piece in here too. Um, so I just kind of use this in here, you know, high whatever components of things. And so um, 
to change this to test component into it. And so once my deployment is up and stabilized, call them right quick, we'll basically redeploy that. So but unfortunately, between cockroach initializing and Kafka initializing, it takes a couple of seconds. Um, the broker takes a few minutes in here, since so it'll take a minute or two to get done. But normally doing a right quit or a right in particular component of that will re-trigger the build. And the build, once everything is up, is pretty quick into these pieces. So to, to your point, Rob, this is, I think, the way most people kind of think of it is the continuous rebuild, redeploy components of things. Um, and I'm just not sure why you're being obnoxious. Let's try this again. I don't want to waste too much time with it. So why this thing comes up to be happy I'll show you a couple of other things. Um, that are kind of useful in this that we put into the, the pipeline as well. Um, so that's waiting to pop up. A couple of other pieces to go into these things. Um, so have you guys heard of Tilt? So this is another kind of front end on top of what you're seeing with the scaffold side. It provides a GUI into it. And so a lot of times what you're doing, you're deploying things into Kubernetes, is you're waiting for, for pods to start. You're looking at why pods didn't start the things. You're tailing the log files, all those components to it. And so we also basically generate the config for something called Tilt. Um, there's actually a Tilt compile in that. And so you can actually watch each of the services, each of their logs, all their components in an automated fashion without having to sit there and issue a bunch of cute control commands into it. So just in terms of operational efficiency, tilt is kind of cool in terms of what we do in that. Um, the other thing I kind of put in is, I mentioned in the middle there was container tests. And so once your container is built, how do I know things are actually done? Did, did the films get put into the paper of binary directory? Did the various files get to where they need to be? Can I execute a command and that kind of stuff? So Google also has a set of what they call container test tools. Um, and so we integrate these into it as well, so that once a container is built, you can basically do uh, smoke test the container to make sure it's actually valid. And then the other thing I just threw in here for the pipeline is another utility that we put in called Dive. Uh, I put links at the back end of this that I can, I can share out to people in this. So Dive basically decomposes the container build, and it looks each of the layers, and it looks at the efficiency of each of the layers that go into these things. And so at the end of it, if you're writing an inefficient container layer, right, or a developer is creating an inefficient, inefficient container layer, they could combine commands together, create less layers, you're wasting space, all the different kinds of dive does kind of a deep dive analysis on the container constructs. And then if you basically run it with a, a variable CI equals true, as I kind of put up here, you can integrate it to the pipeline, it'll basically give you a CI pass, skip, fail, components of things as to whether or not the image is being effectively built into it. Uh, so this is an example of things I would like to incorporate into the pipeline automatically, but today I still have to script this type of stuff, and that's the kind of thing we want to get away from. Uh, so there's a couple other pieces to go into it. Let's try this one more time. See if it's more nice this time. My VM so, so, overload. Okay, so this is this is letting you literally, as you code, you hit save, Build your whole application, it runs a test suite for you. So you've got the whole infrastructure live and you don't have to you don't have to wait for it. It's all uh, yes. basically every time I'm pushing change. your changes incrementally. Yeah, so every time I make a change, this pipeline, when I go do a save in here, right? I should point out one of the piece here. There's one other piece I didn't mention in it. Um, so when I make, do a save in here, right, this entire pipeline gets executed. All right, so it's going to basically do the entire thing. It's going to deploy it, and then I can test against it. The file sync thing I, I didn't okay. mention down here. So let's imagine you have um, what you refer to as personality data files. You have other files that are related to the application, but not part of the application. It could be config files, could be image files, whatever those things are. The other thing you can specify in that scaffold configuration is files that should be synced. So every time there's a change, every time there's a build, I can also specify files that should be synced out, right? <clears throat> so in our case, um, a good chunk of the files you see, when, when we're doing things, we really kind of use a combination of both code generation and templates to actually build the applications out. So some of the files that are produced as part of the application don't exist at the beginning, right? And, and so for example, um, the API documentation, we generate Swagger documentation out of the comments board. We generate dependency graphs. We generate all the other parts that may be part of the proper documentation around those pieces, but they're not part of the code. And so the file sync piece in here would also allow you to push those other artifacts forward into the cluster so they could actually be used as well. 
It could be web pages, could be whatever it goes into it. So there's another sync into this. So yeah, it's taking code detection all the way through deployment and building these pieces out. Right now, does, now you could. Does Scaffold pay to, um, work with SCM at all? Like Git subversion sure. or is this only just local files? No, it, it um, was I kind of said. Could I trigger, like how could I trigger a Scaffold job from, from, from a code, from like a commit or something? So if you're doing a, um, so scaffold is CLI, right? So unless you write something on your local hooks to trigger something out of it, which would be the only way to do it. You, you, you'd have to have a commit hook that basically triggered a scaffold pipeline to it, to do a, a component to it. You, but scaffold like won't, won't pull a, a code repository. Sure. It will? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so when I specify the resources that are out there, Right, I could specify and go pull this code out and then execute. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's why I was trying to make a point at the base is you can specify those as GitHub repositories. Right, so my source code directory could initially be empty and then my resource could, could pull those back out. Uh, but as I said, the most part is you, you've got a, a cloned repository, right? And, and you're working with it to push things through. I think their SCM integration is better suited at this point in life to um, configuration management than source code management, if that makes sense, right? So like I do this stuff now, so whatever, um, right? So yeah, that's what it should have looked like. I'm not sure why it was unhappy to begin with. Something didn't work with uh, the cockroach. So I go to these things, I just make a, a change, now high test, now it's redeployed with those pieces and do it and then, um, you know, the other piece I kind of point out these things is just let me do this real quick and I think we're about killing time. I'll let people ask questions. Let me clean up all I can do it over here. I don't need to wait for you. Right. I just use this as kind of another example. Remember, so since it's, yeah. Apparently, I'm worried about where I'm going to rent my new apartment. <laughs> Freudian typing. Yeah, Freudian typing. So you can see in here, I just did a scaffold render. So while you didn't see all this stuff in the manifest file, you can see the stuff we've asked it to add in here. So the annotations are actually being added into it. You can see it adds its uh, own okay. into here, right? So you see the scaffold run ID, the VI version was added into it in these pieces as we go through it. Right, we can step through these components to it, and so you'll see it's actually customized all these things. Actually, um, right, and then you can see the artifacts, right? The troubleshooting. So you, oops, sorry. Uh -huh. So, you see that's talking about the config map things in here. You can see name, film, config map, and you'll see it's got the hex suffix on to the end of it, right? So, it's generated those pieces in it. But you'll also see if I go into like deployment. I was trying to kind of warn you about if I look at the deployment down here, right, that the name is still Kafka Broker or the name is still Films, right? So I could easily change that with Customize by specifying a different environment into it. And then if I just do um, Manifest, uh, let's just do the profile, uh, I get debug dash dev. Testing my memory. Dev debug, exactly the reverse, how's that? All right, let's mm -hmm. get after this stuff now. Okay, so now where we had these things before, let's go down to the deployment. Remember, the only thing we really kind of asked this thing to do in here is to add in, um, for the films database down here, Right. Remember, we asked it to add in this environment variable down here. Right. Right. So I get my my default environment. Now, by the way, I could have specified overwrite these things based on a given environment. Right. Into those pieces into it, but this is just saying, hey, for debug mode, I just want to have go debug set to true. And, and realistically, the way I kind of did this profile was kind of stupid. Right. What I really should have done in the manifest piece down here is specify. Um, an enabler, right? When I come into the piece down here, I should have said enable equals uh, basically go debug equals true. And then rather than having to specify a given profile, I can just set and unset go debug. And I'm going to basically get the appropriate behavior for debugging into it. Um, so sorry, that was a lot. 
<laughs> well, it's, I mean, it it's, sounds like, you know, 80% of this is helping build the appropriate YAML files, right? I mean, that's, we're talking about deep nested YAML that has to get built just right. So I'm it sure. is. I mean, I think that, uh, well, yeah, it's always about that. I mean, we generate the YAML file. So, uh, you know, over time, so when we generate an application, we generate all the YAML files for all this stuff as well. And then our CLI allows you, as opposed to editing these, we try and simplify that by using a CLI that basically does that for you. Because um, I think most people just get lost in this level of, of nested YAML and how to kind of construct them, uh, or a good chunk will, I should say. Um, and so we try and ease that component to it. But at the end of the day, our criteria uh, for kind of picking tools out of this is it had to be cloud agnostic, you had to be able to deploy anywhere and it had to be completely open source. And then the third criteria was, you shouldn't have to learn something new. And so one of the reasons we stuck with customize is because it's basically native to Kubernetes to begin with, mm -hmm. right? So it's actually part of cube control. So once you've learned how to use customize, you haven't learned, had to learn how to use anything else. We do the same thing with our CLI. If you know how to use cube control, you know how to use road control. As we go into these pieces, we're trying to minimize the number of items developers have to learn um, into the bare bone minimum, right? Because that's really like the big stumbling block right now, right? The learning curve across all these tools is significant, right? And so if I can minimize the amount you need to learn, that's a good, that's a good idea. So uh, yeah, you know, these are the two tools we kind of picked to go through. And, you know, hopefully that was useful or not. Hopefully there's some concepts that are at least useful. Uh, but I'll shut up and let the last question. That's there. interesting. I, there's a part of me that thinks that um, having a uh, lunch and learn on customize itself would probably be an interesting topic. Of, uh, like we did, we did one on JQ, and just JQ took a 45 minute <laughs> talking session. We only scratched the surface. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, we, we totally could. I mean, there's a, I, I just totally touch the surface of what you can actually do with customize. Yeah. Right. As I said, it is the built in tool for Kubernetes. So, you know, if you're trying to do things, it's kind of the, the preferred method to do it. And I think the other one that if, if we weren't doing customized, the other one we would have done was Helm 3. Right. So it's really going to be one of those two things we'd use to deploy to Kubernetes. We, we really wouldn't want to touch something else. Yeah, actually, and it would be fun to have a session just on Helm 3 because I've done some play on Helm 3. And I still find I have to run kubectl pre and post Helm 3 to make it to make it works. So. so the cool part is Scaffold will clean that up for you. Oh, ah, okay. Right. So that's where, like, a lot of people have talked. I, I reached out to a bunch of people who were using Scaffold. And, and a lot of what they do is, is you know, there, there's things that Helm doesn't completely cover, but I can clean those up basically using Scaffold to do those pieces to it. Remember, Scaffold has what I refer to, I should say, Customize has what I refer to as the plugins or the transformers of those pieces to it. Mm -hmm. So there are ways of adding logic into it, right? And the same thing is true. Have you looked at Tecton? No. Right. So Tecton. Well, it's, not, it's not way out of the old, um, uh, te now I'm thinking Tectonics. Sorry, keep going. Nah, so Tecton is another tool that was another Google tool. It basically is a pipeline tool that runs on a Kubernetes cluster. So it's a controller in a Kubernetes cluster. Okay. Uh, and so you specify effectively your, your pipeline and then your pipeline runners and you specify task and task runners. And so it's a way of basically creating a workflow uh, inside of Kubernetes to automate the various pieces that need to get done as part of a pipeline, right? And then when you get to a particular component into it, there's a concept of what they call a task. And for me, well, there's a couple, so there's a few things that you write that, that I should call out. So I think one of the things, this is to my point where I was saying, like, this is where, you know, we, we could do a whole session on why the current CI CD tooling system is just broken. Right? <laughs> and Tecton does a couple of things right and then they don't totally mess it up. So, one of the things they do right is they use the Kubernetes constructs, right? So, the label selectors and, and the labels and selectors that actually build the execution order on these things. So, it does become composable and, and you are basically. Um, executing processes in some order. What they don't do a good job of is abstracting the data that gets handed between task one and task two. They don't normalize that out to where you can plug anything else into it. Um, the second thing they do a good job of is they have a notion of a resource, which is an abstraction of something this thing needs. So a resource could be um, the output of a, a SCA, 
right? I've, I've done a, a lint scan, I've done a security scan, other piece to it. And the next process in this task line, uh, pipeline may need to basically read that, evaluate it, and decide whether or not it's okay to go forward. Yeah. Um, so they do abstract out a resource piece to it. And I think that's great. It's, it's a bit too generic. Um, if you watch what they're doing at Upbound with cross planes or OEM, I think they're doing a better job of starting to standardize some of those interfaces into it. Um, they're not quite there yet. Um, and then where they lose it for me is the, the thing that gets executed is something called a task. And, and a task is literally anything. It could be go run a Jenkins job, run a bash shell script, run a Python script, whatever else. And so when you get down to basically doing single responsibility, right, do one thing and do it well, well, that's where it falls apart. You might you just as well have a bash shell script, right, and tie it together with Argo workflow or any number of workflow tools. But my problem is there's nothing I can do. There's nothing that TechCon does I can't do using Salt or Chef or Puppet, other than the fact that it executes in a Kubernetes cluster, which to me is not necessarily positive. Um, so what I want to see okay. in these things is, you know, well-defined tasks that are part of a pipeline, right? I want to see this. I want to see what are all the things to be part of a pipeline, right? What are the outputs? What are the inputs into it? And how do we cobble this stuff together like the way we would? So if you think about scaffold today and you said we're going to go through a microservice um, a, a peer review on it, would it pass the peer review? And even the authors would go, no, it wouldn't. Right. So I think there's this fundamental disconnect. The things I would expect to see in a function architecture or a microservice architecture, we don't expect those same constructs in the tool network. Right. And I think that's really, and I think it's historical, right? I mean, a lot of the CI, CD, DevOps community comes out of the, the, the system admin scripting world, right? right? Not necessarily the engineering world. And so we don't really bring the same engineering rigor to the CI/CD pipeline that we bring to the applications on it. So I think CI/CD is still treated a bit as a second class citizen, right? As opposed to an equal, if not more important component of, of the delivery pipeline or delivery tool network gets deployed into it. And so I actually wrote some stuff up on this a, a while back as to like, let's just take some you know basic software engineering principles. Let's apply them to our tool network and say, does it stand up? Right, and, and the answer for the most part is it doesn't. And if we did, what are the benefits of it? The benefits are huge, right? Well, um, that gets back to the question was asked about, you know, can I get it to go pull something from a Git repository? The answer should be absolutely. I should be able to take something in this pipeline that says, go, go check something out, and then go do the rest, right? But because it's a monolith today, you can't do that, right? I, I could create a task in the Tekton world that does that. Right, but it doesn't do one thing, it's just executing bash. And so it's like you don't die of bash, you die with it. Yeah, so it's just not a scalable, repeatable uh, component to it. All right, and on right. that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call time on you, but yeah, this yeah, was fascinating, it. thank you. Appreciate it, John. Thank you for pulling this sure. together. This, there was a lot here and uh, it's gonna take me some time to digest it, but we'll record it and we'll see what, see what happens with that. Okay. Good luck with, with selling your house. Uh, give us an update next week. Oh, South is sold. Oh, and you're. I do it now, vacate. <laughs> you got to get out, pack the boxes. All right. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, All right. Let's see. Yeah, next, next week, we are talking about uh, Edge. And then after that, we're talking about firewall migration. So I've, if you know other people who want to speak, just send them my way. We'll have some fun. All right, everybody. Have a good week. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Continue trashing the uh, various. I was using blue jeans at one point um, and like that the the thing for me like I'm a Linux user Linux desktop person mm -hmm. and most it's gotten better but you know zoom and blue jean were really like the only blue jeans were the only ones that actually had real clients yeah it's um, good all the blue jean blue jeans guys run on Linux so they made it work uh, oh, okay. and yeah, that's so why mumble and Jitsi are good because they're all out of the Linux world. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was, you know, I, I was really so. Uh, Blue Jeans was a former. He was my director of engineering. Was the founder of that. At a prior company, I'll get very on. And then Mark Green, who's working with me now, was in the CTO office there. So they worked on the protocol optimization and that stuff. But I was for the longest time, I didn't think they were going to get an exit. Yeah, because they went into an enterprise-centric stuff. They didn't follow the Zoom model where it was a freemium, you know, get started types of pieces. 
you know, they were the gateway between all the various ones. So they made it work very nicely in that stuff. But I mean, the pandemic worked out really well for them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> It's all of a sudden Verizon needs a, a video conferencing platform and there's not a lot out there. And they had a good enterprise base, which fits with Verizon. Yeah. You know, and then as Hans Vesper, the old Ericsson CEO, is now the head of, of Verizon. So it worked out well. Um, they got a nice payday. Okay. There's just a lot of synergies there that weren't necessarily obvious, but it worked out well for those guys. So it was great for them. That's what the tele, I had some friends who did, uh, there's a very small company, but it's like called Live Oak just got purchased by um, DocuSign. And so they were, they were doing, it was super, like if, it felt super simple, like they were using HTML5 to add video to documentation signing processes, like custom made to be acquired by DocuSign. I was really impressed um, and they did. And, but you know, it's in the pandemic, the need for, you know, interaction around a process that includes video is super high. So. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's an interesting and team. So we can trash teams too. if you want. Well, you know, the well, one that's interesting to me. Go ahead. Well, teams was actually uh, the, the competitor to WebEx way back when, when it was placeware and mm -hmm. they just missed the exit window. And so I missed out on money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was I was their uh, production operations engineer and designed their net their uh, architecture their server architecture for them. Oh, cool. Yeah, I didn't get anything out of them though. <laughs> but I did. Well, I got one thing. I got a husband. <laughs> for better or worse, yeah. So it's interesting. We're we're in the process of selling the house we're in right now, and I notice that the the software that they seem to use in real estate is like Lone Wolf software. I mean, when you're signing away mm. like, your house, and it's you know Lone Wolf software. Does this sound right? <laughs> oh, literally Lone Wolf software. <laughs> like literally. Oh dear. Look at the domain. They, is it, isn't that the company that did the Iowa caucus software? Yeah. I, <laughs> it was yeah. some name. It was some name like that. Like like they were they had hired a company to build the the software, and it was something like you know Ultimate Chaos software or something. It was so apropos. The Lone Wolf. Yeah, it's it's That's funny. L, L Wolf .com. electronic signature for real estate, and it's like. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it doesn't, and, and of course now everything today comes with these these huge exclamations of, of wire fraud. So apparently in these large transactions, what's going on is everyone's calling up and pretending to be the escrow agency, and no one's validating it. You send half a million, oh, yeah. million dollars here, and it's gone. I yeah, my my sister and brother in law almost got caught on that one with the vacation. Uh, uh, purchase they realized that like right before the bank started sending it they actually had to go and scramble and keep it from happening holy mackerel yeah. yeah well we're in a process with COVID it turns out now is a really good time to buy property in Hawaii because all the Airbnbs are kind of shut down and the state's still shut down and that stuff so we've been shopping for a house in Hawaii so we're in the process of selling <laughs> this one and, and in 25 days, it will be nomadic. It will no longer have a place to live. Wow. <laughs> so does that mean you're going to end up in Hawaii? or I'm probably going to split between in the, the um, what's what I'm looking for, the irony of all things. We'll have a house in Hawaii and we'll probably have an apartment in Boston. Okay. Yeah. So just long commute when I go home. It'll be <laughs> <laughs> you just have and to. And when we'll be home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we're flipping through that. So, you know, but, so what's you just that? have to be careful of resident residency requirements, right? There's uh we have friends who bought in Hawaii and have a place in Texas, and mm -hmm. they they're six months. They're trying to be six months in a day in Texas, so that they can maintain residency in Texas and deal with this. You know, enjoy our state income tax or a lack of state income tax. Yeah, well, that was the whole reason for moving to Nevada, right? After coming out of California. And we sold, um, we had a, a non-tech business we sold, and we sold um, 
you know, edge gas got sold, components of things, and we got the uh, normal taxes in California, the normal federal taxes, and we got the special Obama taxes at the time. Um, you know, my wife kept writing checks for another 30 grand here, 30 grand there, and she just got pissed off and announced we were moving. So you're in, you, you're in Nevada, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, same here. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's zero percent state income tax is pretty nice. We'll see if that survives yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. Where is everyone else? Mm -hmm. Curiosity. Yeah, we, we're in Nevada too. Okay. Yeah. Whereabouts? California. Yeah. Um, uh, North Lake Tahoe, not far from okay. there. Yeah, no, no, no. You're yeah. short drive. Right by the state border. I'm near <laughs> Fifa, Israel. Ooh. Yeah, far away. I pay That's a lot a long of commute tax. for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Austin, Texas. So. What time is it in Haifa? Like nine fifteen p.m. Ah, having myself a second dinner of popcorn. I like it. <laughs> yeah, we ended up. I, I always eat lunch first. Just it's easier, but. I always had the vision that I would, I would lunch during the, the meeting. It works out. That's my subject. Um, cool. And, and John, we're about to, we're, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to you for the actual topic um, for today, because we are at the 15 minute mark. And so if you're ready to roll, I'm happy to uh, take the sure. lull and, and sure, sure. turn the mic over. Uh, go ahead. No, you got it. You're the, just, yeah. just roll. You should I be good. Say, you, you get it. <laughs> I, I can right, actually. Uh, do I have to ask to share, or can I share screens? Let's see. I'm I making you co. I'm making you co-host officially, right. so you should be able to do it. If not, there you go. You're good. Uh, so let me just do a couple of slides to put some. So I, I question wise.